All right, good evening, everybody. I'm happy. <laughs> so happy everybody's out in this gorgeous day. We finally have warm weather. Um, yeah, well, it was, it was a beautiful day today, Easter. I mean, I'm sorry you were stuck in the office, but some of us weren't. <laughs> anyway, so I'm going to open up in prayer, and uh, we will get started. So, Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity here today. And, Lord, we just give you all the glory and honor that you died on the cross willfully for our freedom. And, Lord, you came to set the captives free. And we are all here thanking you for what you've done for us and will continue to do. So, Lord, I just ask you to open up our hearts. Just give us revelation. Only remind us of things that are necessary that we, you know, to be reminded of, Lord. And, and we just thank you, Father, for freedom and deliverance this evening. And, Lord, we just give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen. So some of you were not here last week. Um, we have uh, t we taped last week's message. It was more of an introduction to um, deliverance. So you can go back and watch that. And um, because tonight I'm going to speak on the spirit of rejection. And really there's so much that I want to cover tonight that I really don't want to go back and, um, you know, uh, rehearse what I taught last week. But before that, I'm going to call for Linnell. Where's Linnell? Linnell came up to me and said, um, are you going to take an offering? She goes, because I always forget. So um, Linnell, come on up. Hello. Um, yeah, so when I was on my way here, I just was thinking to myself about like how much deliverance I've gotten since I've been at King of Kings. Um, <laughs> so much and like not that I don't need more but <laughs> it's, it's 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 pretty evident that that I've been set free in many areas in my life and um you know and I just I thought to myself that like wow I, I want to give into this like it's it's awesome teaching we don't get this everywhere that you just can't go everywhere and get training for deliverance you can't go everywhere and get deliverance and you know the bible says that jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and and that's so that we could be free he gave his life so that we could be set free and so i just thought it would be awesome for us to give an opportunity for it to give into this to be able to sow a seed so that you can reap the fruit of deliverance as well in the training. Um, so you can give on, on the website. Uh, you can mail in something. <laughs> this is, Facebook has a donate button, and I believe you can text to give as well. And, and then you can also use the Typely app. <laughs> so yeah, um, we're just excited about tonight, and we hope that you'll be able to give as well. Thank you. Thank you. God is good. He is. How many of us have been set free here? And can, like you said, we're continuing to be set free because none of us have arrived, right? And, um, and I just thank God for the healing ministry that Jesus didn't just die on the cross just for us to get to heaven. He died on the cross so that we can live an abundant life. Because John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I've come to give you that life more abundantly. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. So as you know, last week I started out teaching on how deliverance is a healing ministry. And it's, it's something that, um, you know, everybody really should go through. I don't think everybody has a spirit, but if you've never gone through deliverance, you probably have something. So, but, <laughs> but, you know, Jesus desires you know and the more we grow the more we mature in the lord our soul is what needs to be healed because when we're born again our spirits are automatically born again but it's our the soulless realm as you know that needs to get um sanctified so tonight i'm, I'm going to teach on the spirit of rejection and this particular one here pretty much if you're human and you're alive here you've battled rejection amen and I'll tell you, though, this spirit of rejection is a, is, I, I, you know, is a masterpiece of satanic oppression. And it robs Jesus of his rightful position with us. Because that spirit of rejection causes us to withdraw, causes us to not accept his love, have a problem with receiving. And it's really something that uh, I'm going to elaborate on it, but it's really something that really hinders us from entering into the fullness of the Lord. 
And it's something that I had to deal with, uh, you know, for a long time, and I still am pretty careful about it. But it's something that can cause you to second-guess yourself, not walk in the destiny plan of what the Lord has for you. It's just insidious. So uh, it wounds us so, so deeply. And, and many people go around untreated with this spirit of rejection and have many emotional issues and really the root of it is rejection. So we'll discuss that. So rejection has a way of destroying a person's life in a way that other, no other things can. And the sad fact is, as I said, many of us have it. Many of us have um, really struggled with it. Thank God many of us are set free from it. But some are still really struggling with it. And I, every now and then I start tapping into that thing and I recognize it. And, and then I have to, like, back myself up and say, no, wait a second, and then start decreeing the word of God. So if we want to be all that God has created us to be, then we have to overcome this. All right? It's just the bottom line. It affects us internally. And, and you know, again, the word, like I said last week, the word has to have final say. Because how many times do we say, oh, I don't feel love. Well, I don't feel that God's answering my prayer. Or I don't really feel this. Or I don't feel that. See, it's got, faith is not about a feeling. It's, our, it's, it's by the word. And the word has to have final say here. And so that was something that was really important for me because I had really struggled with the acceptance being accepted and you know uh it was that performance thing which we'll get into in a moment and just really had major issues with that right peter right. yes okay <laughs> so rejection is denial of love it's not the only thing but it, there there is a denial of love or or you know a lot of times it's a perception that there's a denial of love and um you know and so what does the bible say about the lord it says god is love and so if there's going to be an issue there hindering the love walk with the Lord, a lot of times it's the root of rejection. Because how many times we've counseled a gazillion people and how many times the, the, what, what the issue is, they don't feel accepted. Right. How many times have we heard, I don't feel like I fit in. I don't feel like I'm accepted, right? So, you know, when we're rejected, we feel unloved. We feel that we're disapproved of and, and we're excluded. And, and we're de we feel that we're denied of the love and, and, and uh, even respect. All right. So, but we know that love defeats the enemy. That's why he hates anything, any kind of teaching about the Father's love. I'm telling you, the Father's love message is what really was a turning point for me. And truly learning to accept that he loves me. Yeah. I'm accepted in the beloved, yeah. not because of how I perform, not what I can do, not for living, you know, a life of perfection. God loves us. He died on the cross. He knew what we were like, and he chose to die on the cross for us. And that's, that's what's so beautiful about the Lord. I, I typed, I didn't have it on your handout, and, but in 1 John 4, 16, um, I wrote it out on my notes in the Passion and it says here, we have come into an intimate experience with God's love, and we trust in the love he has for us. God is love, and those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. I just love the way that's worded. Those who are living in love are living in God. And that means just like we just have to accept the love of God regardless of what the enemy is telling us. And there's a battle there. All right, so it, rejection attacks the very person of who we are. It destroys our self-esteem. It, it attacks who we are and our purpose in life. And everybody responds to rejection in a different way. Everybody suffers with rejection in a different way, and we'll get into that. So it's one of the most common tools of the enemy and that he uses to destroy a person's life, period. God never, ever, ever wants us to feel rejected or abandoned. Because what does he say? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Never. But how many times we hear or have we said, I feel so alone. I feel like nobody understands me. I mean, we've all said it, yeah. most of us. Yeah. And so, but God is saying, will you listen to them? I have my word here. And I died on the cross for them. And they are accepted in the beloved. And so that's where, that's the battlefield there is in our mind. And so that's where we have to war against what the enemy says. Now, not every time you're experiencing this rejection or these thoughts, not every time means you have a spirit. 
but there is a spirit of rejection that you have to get set free from and understand that at the, as the enemy taunts you with this, his goal, God bless you, his goal is to have that open door where that spirit comes in, all right? So the, uh, the Lord desires for us to know who we really are. And because this rejection also affects purpose and destiny, how many times do we hear, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I'm called to. I've said it. <laughs> Even pastoring, I've said it. So God loves us and he accepts us and he wants us to know his purpose and his plan. He said, well, how does it go in Jeremiah? For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not fail. He has a, he has, there's an expected end. There's a direction that he has for us. So God word, God's word tells us that without being rooted and grounded in the love of God, that we will have we cannot experience the fullness of the Lord. And that is on your handout. And I typed it out in Ephesians 3, 19 in the Passion. I really love the way it's worded. It says here, now we're talking about the love of God. Then you will be empowered to discover what every holy one experiences, the great magnitude of the astonishing love of Christ in all its dimensions. How deeply intimate and far-reaching is his love. How enduring and inclusive it is. Endless love beyond measure that transcends our understanding. And this extravagant love pours into you until you are filled to overflowing with the fullness of God. I just love that. And you can see, you know, there, it's an action word there. Until we are filled, it's a constant thing. We're constantly being overflowed with his love so that we operate in the fullness of the Lord. Now, we know that Jesus is, was the man like us when he when, when he was on earth right in the bible in in isaiah and i'm going to read it to you the message version in the message version from uh verses one through six he endured and he experienced rejection all right so even when we're going through it he knows exactly what we're feeling so listen to this it says who believes what we have heard and seen who would have thought god's saving power would look like this the servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who, who knew pain firsthand. One who looked, I mean, I'm sorry, one look at him and people turned away. We looked down on him and thought he was scum. Wow. 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 So think about how he was rejected. His peers, his disciples, the people he hung out with, everybody rejected him. And the pain that he endured in his heart. And so, you know, I said, Lord, I know that you understand us because you know our frame. You know what we're made up of. And your desire is you, it, your death was not in vain for us to walk in freedom and to truly accept the love of God and to know that God has the purpose and plan for us. So what's some of the fruit of rejection? All right. So many people who have faced rejection and abuse as children grow up with unresolved emotional issues. Now, let me just say this. It doesn't even have to be real traumatic issues growing up. For some, it is. But there's a perception especially it affects young kids where their perception of things is so off. I mean, they'll, they'll see things but not really fully understand it. That's what cracks me up with this transgender thing, you know, letting five- and six-year-olds make decisions when they can't even drive a car at 16. You know, they have to wait. And here they're five years old, and you're going to allow them to make a decision about their, you know, sexuality. They can't perceive. Their perception is totally off. And so a lot of kids perceive things that are incorrect. Like, for example, a parent, you know, your parents could ha be having a fight and the kid could be in the room and the child thinks, oh, that was my fault that they fought and it, and it had nothing to do with you. I mean, how many times have we seen and heard that? And we've seen that in counseling so often where they have just perceived something. How many times have we perceived something that we thought even people were talking about us or people were looking at us in a funny way and you're thinking... I know they don't like me. I can see the way they looked at me, and I can see what they're, they're, see, they're looking at me with a dirty look. And meanwhile, they can't see, and they're trying to see something, and they're looking this way, but you're thinking that they're looking at you with a, you know, funky look. I've done it. <laughs> so I know from experience, like, what are they looking at? And then you get an attitude about it. <laughs> so rejection causes emotional wounds, all right? 
And so if it's not cleansed and released, if we don't address it, we'll grow into an individual. We'll grow into something that God didn't create. We'll have an emotion. We'll have a personality that that's not who we are. So these spiritual wounds can open us up to spirits of rejection that you need deliverance. And it's such a shame, too, that the church at large, most, a lot of churches have denied this. And so many people have struggled with different areas in their lives, and they have not lived a victorious life. Right. And the goal of the enemy is to cause us to, to live with emotional baggage. And Jesus, if the Bible says Jesus came to set the captives free, then he came to set us free. Amen? Yeah. So rejection has a lot of fruit. So on your handout, I have this. So rebellion happens in both children and adults. What are some of the different ways, you know, that, that rejection can enter in? Um, you know, a parent could be uh, disappointed in the baby sex. And, um, you know, the, the babies feel a lot of stuff in the wound. I mean, my mom, she, she meant the, I mean, my mother was good to me, but my mom wanted me to be a boy. And she, how many times on my birthday in here, you know, uh, my mother was from Italy. And she would say, you know, uh, I was so upset when you were born, you know, because, huh? She, my mother cried. And she told the doctor, he can have me because it, I wasn't a boy. And then she said, but then when your father saw you, he loved you. You know, you were, he said, you were a beautiful baby, so we can keep you. Now, okay. Now, I understand, and I know my mom loved me, but as a kid growing up hearing this for my birthday each year, how do you think it made me feel? I didn't feel real good about myself. And I would get really angry about that and felt so rejected and like, oh, my gosh, you know, the poor, I felt bad that my father didn't have a boy. That, 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 you know, so I try to be that boy. You know, I try to be mechanical. I try, I wanted to be for him what, you know, I really wasn't. So you have uh, people being bullied in school, right? You have boarding school issues. You know, we've dealt with people here who kids have gone to boarding school. And even though the parents meant well, w wanted their kids to have an exceptional, you know, education, there was a boarding school. I mean, they were away. They were isolated from their family. So you have, uh, you know, people being treated unfairly. You have uh, overly um, controlling parents or where they're so strict, not giving the kid, you know, breathing room. Alcoholism. And let me just say this. This isn't to put anybody down. If maybe you've done it or you've experienced it. Remember, everybody did, you know, they did the best that they could right. with whatever they had. You know, I was thinking of stuff today, and I thought, oh, God, I have to call my kids and repent as I was rereading some of these things, you know. You thought you were doing... Oh, okay, tell them I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so alcoholism in the home, poverty, when you have parents that are alcoholics, and you have to walk on eggshells. You don't know each day whether you're coming or going. You're so afraid. Um, when you're in, impoverished, when there's poverty, and then the kids are going to school, and, and they don't have proper clothing, or they don't have the latest, uh, you know, sneakers, or their, their cell phone, and they're really embarrassed by that, right? Yeah. All right, so um, the tendency to reject others. So a lot of times what happens is you'll reject others before they reject you. And so you can act all snotty with them or, or you have a very, you know, standoffish personality. Why? It's not that you really want to do that. You're, in, you're, you're, you're protecting yourself. You see, and God is saying, no, this isn't how I created my people. I want you to have joy. I want you to have relationship with people. I want you to interact with people. So there's a tendency to always wonder, will they like me? You know, there's a tendency to that performance thing. We teach that in Elijah House. I was the poster child for performance orientation. If it wasn't perfect, and, and guess what? It was never perfect, even though you try to make everything perfect. And, oh, my Lord, that, that was there a lot of pressure, unnecessary pressure. And um, there were times that, I mean, I wouldn't even invite. I was so, I struggled so much with this. I was so embarrassed to invite people to my house, not because anything was wrong with my home. I was, uh, I couldn't handle them saying no, they couldn't come because I took it as rejection. Wow. Thank you. Babysitters, I couldn't even ask them because if they said no, I took it personal. Not, not that they may have plans, but I took it personal that they didn't want to be with us. And then if I was going to invite anybody over, I always had to have another couple so that the couple will enjoy being with the other people instead of us. I'm, I'm a long way 
I have come a long way, baby. <laughs> no, but I'm serious. And then the one time I was trying to make everything so perfect, and I stuffed everything in this one closet, and we're all sitting there around the table, and ready, you want everything perfect, and that you just have it so together. And as we're talking, I hear the, in the closet, boom, and everything that I stuffed in the closet came out of the closet. The door came flying open. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. So no matter what I tried to do, you know, that the Lord's like, girl, you're going to get free from this thing, you know. <laughs> and I was devastated. But now I would have been like, well, come on, Marion, come and clean my house. I don't care. <laughs> I've come a long way, baby. Don't let her come to your house because she will critique it. But I'm like, <laughs> anyway, so in love, in love, in love. So, you know, you know, and then you have a tendency to have self-pity. And you get into that place where everything, woe is me. Oh, when it comes to me, they're not going to like me. Oh, my gosh, no matter what I do, I can't succeed. And, you know, you feel all alone. But it's really real when you're going through it. You know, I mean, I, you know, I'm laughing now, but when, when those things happen, you're dead. I remember another time we invited these ministers over to our house, and, and I was cooking this chicken, and I accidentally, I was supposed to put paprika on the chicken, and it was cinnamon. <laughs> I was so upset. I mean, no matter the more I tried, the worse it was. So anyway, so I had to really get over this thing. I thought, Lord. And then when the, one of the couple of the first times I was asked to preach, I, pre, I had a message prepared for really it was like 12 weeks worth of information that I tried to get in 45 minutes. And then I would ask my husband, was it okay? If he said it wasn't, he was in trouble. And if he said it was okay, he still got in trouble because I didn't believe him. So, you know, so it creates a lot of havoc, and it, and it causes a lot of strife in the home. Wow. <laughs> right? I did, really. I did. I spoke real. And I, this, is, this is without drugs. I mean, the old me, that was drugs. You know, I could have used something there. <laughs> but I, I'm set free now. I mean, I haven't done that. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, Jesus. Anyway, so, okay, so what are some of the symptoms of it? One of the things that's really hard when you're dealing with someone who's really struggling with rejection is an inability to receive correction. And part of that is not that you don't want to be teachable. You're so devastated that you're not perfect and you're not getting it right. And when the person's correcting you, you want to throw yourself off the roof because you're so overwhelmed and so, so uh, disappointed in yourself. And so there's an inability to be corrected or receive constructive criticism. And rejection creates an environment where you're starved for love. And so what happens is you just don't fit in. And then you hear that. Then it, 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 it just reinforces your lack of acceptance. Okay? So, and then you have a tendency to blame God. If you don't like your physical appearance, if you don't like the way you look, or if you don't like this thing going on in your life, you know, we have a tendency where we can um, release aggression towards God. So we have to repent of that. And then, or else you can, be very, you can become very prideful when you're battling with rejection, feeling of worthlessness, insecurity, hopelessness, seeking appearance of few, uh, re, uh, approvals, a sign that you're basing your identity or others on what they think of you. Now, I want to give you an example in the Bible that I thought was pretty apropos. It's in, if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel 1. And this is with um, Hannah and Penaniah. And you can see here the struggle that she had. And, and for those of you, are you all familiar with um, Hannah and Penaniah here? In 1 Samuel 1, and I'm going to start, there was a certain man in verse 1, it says, of Rathama, I don't know how to say it. And he, his name is Ephraim. And, I'm sorry, his name was Elkanah. And, and he had two wives. Now, right there, you're going to have a problem. Right, <laughs> you're going to have a problem with two wives, okay? Right. That was Old Testament. All right. So the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. All right? So right there, Penaniah's name literally meant, means a pearl. And how, do you, how does a pearl develop? Through agitation, right? And so there was an agitation that occurred between Hannah and Penaniah. And it says, the man went up uh, from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And also the two sons of Eli. And he said, and whenever there came a time for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Penaniah 
and to all her sons and daughters, but to Hannah, he would give a double portion for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb and her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. And that word there, miserable, literally means violently agitated. There was rage. She was indignant. Now, that's a picture of, we can look at it as a church. God loves us and wants to give us a double portion. But because we're not seeing ourselves in a way that God sees us, right? You can say here, you know, Hannah was so miserable. She wasn't accepting the double portion. She wasn't accepting the love from her, her husband. I was reading this today, and I thought, you know what? That's so much like the church. God loves us with an everlasting love. Uh, I, I don't want to send it to anybody. <laughs> God loves us with an everlasting love. And we have to understand, we have to understand that, that um, what happens is we take that as rejection from the Lord. We take that as uh, just being so unhappy because our focus is on the wrong thing. There is barrenness there. And so rejection causes barrenness. Wow. It causes barrenness in your emotions. Wow. And so it says year after year after year. Isn't it like us? Year after year. We're in church. It says here, she went up to the house of the Lord, but she was provoked. And she said that, therefore, she wept and she didn't eat. And so year after year, we can go through the motions of being in church. We can go through the motions of doing our due diligence and doing whatever. And yet, you know, our religious duty, so to speak, but yet we're not getting freedom. And it wasn't until Hannah cried out to God. And it said her soul cried out. She sorely, you know, she released that bitterness of soul in verse 10. It says she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. And she made a vow unto the Lord. And, and you know, Eli, he wasn't very perceptive. I mean, he wasn't discerning. He, said, he actually accused her of being dr of drunk. Here she is crying out to God. Could you imagine how you would feel? Like, are you for real? Here you're supposed to be a spiritual leader and you're accusing me of drinking. Even more that, that you know, when... You, when you have that rejection-causing spirit, you actually attract rejection. You attract that behavior. And so, anyhow, so she, but she cried out. And when she, it says there in one of the, the portions, it says that she, she was a woman of a sorrowful spirit, and she poured out her soul. Her, she poured out, she cried out to the Lord, humbled herself with all that she was battling with, and the Lord answered her. And then the barrenness was broken. See, that's what we have to do because, listen, we, I'm going to give you, we're going to pray at the end. We're going to take authority over certain things. But, listen, God is simple, and he's saying, just cry out to me. But choose to believe the word of the Lord where you believe that you are loved and accepted in the beloved, period. Right. It's not because of what you can do. He knows what you've done. He knows what you think. So you might as well just pour your heart out to him anyhow and allow him to bring the healing in. Because, listen, we are in end times, and I really do believe it. I mean, I've heard it for 30 years, some odd years, but we really are. And so what we need to do, there's a harvest out there. They need to see the glory of God within us yeah. and that we are walking in the, in the presence of the Lord regardless of what we're going through. Right. And so anyway, there's feelings, and she was feeling hateful towards Penaniah and, and jealous and envious. See, when you're confident in who you are, when you're secure in your walk, you don't really struggle with that. And if it rises up, you know how to put it down. Right. And it happens. And so, you know, so right here, the enemy always is after our identity. And isn't it interesting in these times, what's really being attacked is identity. That's right. Oh my gosh, pansexual. Uh, transgender. I never heard of it. I had to look. I'm like, what in the world's half this stuff up? You're either a male or female. Let me just say that. Okay, that's the way God designed us. We're male or female. And so the enemy's after attacking our identity. And so that's why we have to know. That's one of the main things we teach, especially in deliverance, when we're bringing people through deliverance, is do you know who you are in Christ? Not, it's not a mental thing. It's hear what the Lord says about you, that you're his son, you're his daughter. Yeah. He loves you with an everlasting love. And we're going to go through some of those scriptures. But that's really, really, really important to get free from, um, you know, the, the uh, rejection-causing spirits, all right? So stubbornness can also be rooted in rejection as well as, you know, for the same reason, feeling worthless. You can be very opinionated. 
you know, again, it's, it's you, you can't, you don't want anyone to tell you you're wrong because you're, that's what you're, you're forming your identity in. Some people are just, they're so intellectual. And you know, when you're around that person, it's like, you just want to tell them to just hush up already. <laughs> they just want to just talk and talk and talk and just tell them, you know, let you see how brilliant they are. But it's like, oh Lord, you know, but there's nothing there. So, you know, but, you know, it's funny because you think you're, you're really getting over and you're really not because people can read this, all right? So people who struggle with rejection can also become fixers. They want to fix everything when really what they're doing is taking the job of Holy Spirit because that's his job. I mean, we can guide them. We can be, I remember, you know, when I started in, to get involved in deliverance ministry and when the Lord, um, you know, really threw me into this, he said to me, you will be a midwife to people. He says, but I'm the deliverer. And so we can guide people and lead them towards, you know, the way of freedom, but he sets the captives free. Amen. So Anyway, so we have to know, again, and I'm going to keep saying that we, we are loved, we are accepted in the beloved. And this rejection spirit is an antichrist spirit because it opposes the very nature of God that's created in us. And we are to, to be imitators of God, and God is love. Yeah. So if you don't love you, right, because you have self-hatred, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, but if you don't love you, how can you love others, Right? So a rejection starves a person from love and acceptance that they were designed to receive. All right, and the problem is that when we turn to others or even ourselves for that love and acceptance, we are accept, uh, setting ourselves up for failure because only God can give us that. When we, you know, the Bible says man will fail you. And so when you're looking only to this individual or that your husband or your wife or only your minister or whomever, your boss, and you're only looking to them for acceptance and not him, that I am accepted in him. Not that you don't want to do well on your job. I'm not talking about that. But that's where you're going to have a problem. Right. And you're setting yourself up for failure, and it is a really a plan of the enemy. All right? And so we can only trust God's source of identity that he's, he's, he's design, he, mm, that he designed for all of us, all right? So when a person is rejected, he'll recoil, he'll, he'll pull back from really getting close to people. He'll isolate, because why? You don't want to get hurt. And so then how do people read that? Wow, that person's not friendly. Ugh, I don't want to be around that person. And meanwhile, that person really wants to be friendly. They really want to have your friendship, but because of that, you know that there's been some kind of wounding in their heart that God wants to heal. All right, so then you have major trust issues. And in order to prevent more hurt, you know, the, uh, you, know you, you pull, again, you, you pull back, and you, then you're very suspicious. You don't trust people. Why are they being nice to me? Why are you smiling? You know? <laughs> I remember my cousin from Italy kept smiling. I thought, what's this guy's problem? How come you're always smiling? Like, it did. I wasn't safe then, you know. But... Wow. Um, and he said, I'm just smiling. I thought, why? You know? <laughs> so anyway, so self-rejection is another piece of this puzzle. All right. And this is really critical because most people reject themselves. So if you have a real strong issue, I used to always pretend I had a different name, that I lived in a different city, that I was a different person, that I looked differently. You know, I always pretended, right? I mean, you can identify. And so, um, and, you know, because you don't like who you are. And remember, from birth, I was told I wanted to give you away to a doctor. <laughs> you know, and the doctor said, I'll take her. And I'm like, oh, great. My own parents didn't want. You know, but they didn't might hear. Again, most of our parents didn't mean anything. Now, some did. But most of our parents only did what they knew to do. Right. And so I'm not criticizing it. It's not about bashing our family members, because that's not my heart here, all right? So self-rejection. So what are some of the symptoms? You can be a cutter. I, I used to do that. Self-harm, insecurity, inadequacy, fear of all kinds, anxiety, worry, or depression. And, and I really had struggled with a lot of depression because you, you just don't see life. You don't, you don't, not seeing it through God's lens. You're looking at it through defeat. You're looking at it through hopelessness. You're looking at it through fear you're, you're not looking at it in a healthy manner and so a lot of times you have if there's self rejection or self unforgiveness you're not forgiving of yourself and you have to listen the bible says you have to forgive 
Otherwise, he cannot forgive us. And what we have found in deliverance is that most often when we're really having a hard time, if we've walked the person through deliverance and had them renounce bitter judgments and, and inner vows and renounce different things, and, and most often if they're not getting free, it's because there's unforgiveness. And most of the time, it's self-unforgiveness because of the mistakes and that you can't forgive yourself. Well, God has forgiven you. Who are you? then keep holding that unforgiveness towards yourself, all right? So it can do as, just as much damage, and so we have to be very careful of that. So, and, and I want you to just think about, you know, just issues in your life. If, if you're still struggling with that, if there's any area, it could be a small area of self-rejection, and that really will hinder you from entering into the love of the Father. Then we have, and I mentioned it earlier, perceived rejection, where a person receives something as rejection when it really isn't. Right? So why are you looking at me like that? You got a problem with me? Why are you looking at me like that? Wow. <laughs> right? I mean, wow. how many times have we gotten offended over people? <laughs> looking at us like that, you know? Wow. And thinking, oh, my God, they're making. So then there's a part of you, let's say part of your body or your physical body, that you don't care for. It. They're, they're making fun of me. I can tell. I know they're looking at that. I know they're looking at this. I know they're saying that about me, right? And then you have all this, this mental gymnasium, you know, going through your mind and you're rehearsing and nothing even happened. Right? right? And here the enemy and the person's like, like I said, didn't have their glasses on, couldn't see and they're squinting. And you're, you're already telling them off because you think they're, telling, they're making fun of you. And so that's where we have to really, again, be careful of that. And so um, I, how many times I, I remember... Um, Years ago, years and years ago, like if I'm walking in a room and you say hello to someone, they don't say hello to you. Who do they think they are? I can't believe they're they're such snot. They're not even saying hello to me. Meanwhile, the person didn't even see me. But but and I've done that now, where I um you know you're so caught up in your own thought process, and that even though you see the person, but you're not really seeing them. Has that ever happened to you? And you're just in your own little world. See how we do that? And what does the enemy love? The enemy loves for us to be at odds with each other. He wants to cause disunity when God is a God of unity. So, um, all right, so perceive rejection. So when a person, I, you know, I just said that. All right. So people who have a spirit of rejection have a tendency to receive. There's perceived rejection. We, this is what we do with, in deliverance. Perceived rejection, expected rejection, and then you have rejection, okay, and self-rejection. And so perceived rejection can also make you feel as though God has rejected you. Let's look at it. Your prayers aren't getting answered. God's not doing what you want him to do. Why? So in your mind, maybe it's not in the forefront of your mind, but it's somewhere in there, God's rejecting me. It's because it's me. If it were so-and-so, he'd answer your prayer, but he's not answering my prayer. Have you ever felt that? You don't have to say yes, but have you ever felt that? I know I've done it. So uh, I think it's really interesting on your handout I have here, 1 Samuel 10:20. And uh, 22 in New Living Translation about Saul. And I, I, this portion of scripture always stuck out to me. And I think it's also representative of rejection. It says here in verse 20, Samuel, so Samuel, who was a prophet, brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord. And the tribe of ben Benjamin was chosen by Lot because they wanted to anoint Saul as king. Then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and the family of the Matriots were chosen. And finally, Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. He was chosen to be king. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. And when they asked the Lord, where is he? The Lord replied, he's hiding among the baggage. And to me, that's such a picture of rejection. We hide among our baggage. And that word hid there means to withdraw and to draw back and to be hardened. And see, that's the thing. We don't want to hide in the baggage. Now's the time. And obviously, none of you here and even those who are watching, you don't want to hide any longer. You want to deal with the roots because we want to walk in absolute freedom. And so I don't want to hide in the baggage like Saul did. But let's look at the life of Saul, how he really royally messed up. And, and so in that place of rejection, because he was so insecure who he was, it caused him to have a rotten attitude and to want to kill Saul, I mean uh, David, and we'll read that in a minute. He was just so insecure and he became really jealous. Yeah, that's right. 
So in 1 Samuel, on your handout, uh, 18, 7 through 11, you know, it says here, um, now, they, now he was very close with David. And so what, what happened was when, when David started getting more attention, that, that friendship, that love he had turned to hate. And it says here, and the woman answered one another as they played and said with Saul, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands and to me they ascribe but thousands. And what could he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed, literally meaning that he looked with jealousy upon David from that day forward. And it came to pass in the morrow the next day that the evil spear from God came upon Saul and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And, and so anyway, this, when, you, when you operate in that, you can open yourself up to a spirit. And so David, my goodness, I mean, David, I mean, Saul was trying to kill him because of the jealousy. And that's what, that's what that does. And when you study the life of Saul, you see in what his end was awful. And see, I don't, and so when, usually like when you're teaching about Saul and David, it's the spirit, Saul, uh, David representing the spirit, David representing the flesh. And so, I'm sorry, uh, Saul representing the flesh. And so I don't want to be that. I don't want to operate in the, fle in the flesh. The whole idea of our maturity in Christ is to develop and to mature and grow in the spirit. And God will meet us all where we're at. And the thing that I love about him, he'll take us by our hands and he'll walk us through with his love. He's not critical. He's not condemning. He's not going to shame you. He's going to love us and walk us through. But the key thing that he said to me, you must receive my word. I have, most of the time when you're battling with rejection, you have a hard time receiving love. You have a hard time receiving gifts. It's okay for you to give a gift, but it's a real hard time. You have a very, very hard time receiving well, the Lord said to me, unless you learn to receive, Tricia, he said, you're not going to be able to really receive my love. And he said, I, there are people on earth that want to bless you, and you're rejecting it. You know how many times, oh, no, you don't need to do that. Oh, don't do that. Don't give me that gift. No, 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 You know, and how do you feel when you want to bless somebody with it and the person's doing it? You want to smack them with it. Like, hey, just take the gift. So... You know, we have to be careful of that. So now I'm like, before I used, my toes would curl. And I thought, oh, Lord, Jesus, they're giving me. And it wasn't that I didn't want it. I didn't know how to receive it. And now it's like, bring it on, you know. <laughs> now it's different. I've gotten a lot of healing. So anyway, so, um, so it's, it, the rejection's not the sin. It's our reaction to it. It's our reaction to how we behave. And God wants us to have a broken, contrite spirit. So... Now, in closing, you know, well, well let me read this. When, I'm not going to get into the rebellion. You want to say something, yes. Peace? Yes. Don't you love my wife? Yeah. Uh, so I watched her deal with all these things, you know, firsthand. And I was one of the people that would tell her how much I loved her, and she had a hard time receiving it. And... Um, you know, I didn't grow up in a similar kind of situation, so I was more used to validation. And um, so, I, you know, I, it just dawned on me that the reason covenant is so important in marriage is because you're, you're unconditionally accepting your mate, right? That's what God is asking you to do. You're coming to an altar. It's not a, a, a contract, you know, with the justice of the peace. It's a holy thing. And two people who were separate are becoming one now, and that means... You know, even with the flaws, that you're not going to bail on them. So you have to ask the Lord to help you understand your partner, and and it's not always easy to understand because you didn't live what they lived through. But the Lord will help you, and the Holy Spirit will help you, and and that's kind of the strategy that you need, even if it's just you. If you're if you're just single, let's just say, like in Trisha's example, she had to learn how to forgive her mom and and learn how to say she did the best she could because. We didn't know the pain that she was in, but then we found out the pain that her mother was in growing up. And once you do that, the Lord gives you compassion for the person who hurt you, and then you can truly forgive them. I think it's hard to move forward on your own if you don't do that, but it's also almost impossible in the natural without the Lord's help because all you can think about is, man, you know, you were, you were supposed to support me and you didn't, so how could I let you go for that? Well, because they didn't get the support. It's hard to give what you didn't have. So, you know, the prayer piece is just incredibly important that you just say, Lord, you know, 
help me even have a conversation with my mother to find out why she might have been that way and happened with my father who had a really bad temper and I didn't know why and I remember like just reacting to his rage and as I got older and I understood the Lord I would talk to my dad about it and then I got insight into the why and I could pray and I could see him through a different lens of compassion through the Lord instead of just well you didn't do this for me and that for me well hey you had a rough life too right so that changed our whole relationship when the Lord put that clue in my mind. But it also changed our marriage when I realized, you know, like we like to say, it sounds almost cliche, marriage isn't 50-50. It's 100-100, right? And you can't say, well, your 100 isn't cutting it, you know? <laughs> like Your 100 is the best you can do right now, and it's m partly my job to help you f find out who you really are. And for the millionth time, no, I really do love you. <laughs> Even though she's saying she doesn't believe it, it's okay because we're going to be in this thing forever. And look, that's part of the problem in the culture today is people just live together and they think they can have all the benefits of marriage without the commitment. Look, it's just a blatant lie. You know, you're standing on an altar and you're saying for better or for worse and two are going to become one, which means, you know, I heard a psychologist say you don't want to win a fight with your spouse because then you're living with a loser. It's not a fight with a win and a lose, right? We're allies, not adversaries. Not that Trish would ever want to fight, but just, you know. Love you. About to have one right now in public. <laughs> no, we're not. But here's the other thing, too, what he said. If, um, now, sometimes you're not able to talk with your parent. Sometimes they're very abusive. Sometimes you've endured a lot of trauma. But see, our Father in heaven will help us reconcile. And there's redemption in the blood. There's redemption in bringing your hurts and bringing the situation. He's the only one that can help us to forgive. We, we can, you know, and like what we, when we're praying with people, it's, Lord, I choose to forgive my mother. I choose to forgive my father for such and such and such. And he's the one that brings the healing in. But it's being intentional. It's not, well, I have a right to walk in forgiveness. No, you don't. Because if you don't, it's like carrying, you know, a dead person on your back forever. And I, heard, I think it was Sergio Scatolini or somebody I heard say that um, it's like you having a bottle of water and you have 1% of sewage, sewage in it and, and drinking it. You know, that's what unforgiveness is. It's a disgusting picture, right? But, but that's what unforgiveness is. We can't afford to walk in unforgiveness. Right. Cannot. And, it's, and, and um, Jack Hayford wrote a book. It was called The Gift of Forgiveness. And uh, on the cover, it had this beautiful big pink package. And he said it was God's gift for us to forgive. And that always stuck out with me. So we have to understand that the Lord Jesus, you know, came to set the captives free. And he doesn't want us operating in that place of, of rejection. And, you know, again, when my, I forgot about that. When my husband, the first three years of marriage, I didn't believe he loved me. I thought, yeah, sure, you know. And and my, pro I'm thinking, you know, why would he love me? Well, why would he love me if I don't love me, right? So God had a really deal in my heart. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to do this. But he said, well, I want you to receive the word. Because remember, at the time, there wasn't a whole lot of stuff on deliverance. And he started to bring me through and teach me about how to get set free. And, to, and it was a process, of how to get set free and, and had it had, you know, demons cast out of me and how to be set free and then emotionally get healed, have my soul healed. All right. So um, in First Samuel 15, 23, it says for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou has rejected the word of the Lord. He's rejected you from being king. Now he's talking about Saul. And when there's rejection, there's rebellion. Because you can either take on the personality of a passive aggressor or you can be very in your face, rebellious. I'm not doing anything. I'm not listening to you. Don't tell me what to do. You know, I took that route. <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. You know, because you didn't trust anyone. You were suspicious and you got that hard edge. And that's not God. God doesn't want us to behave that way. And so, you know, again, it was a process, and I had to renounce the rebellion, but rebellion was also a way of protecting me, so I thought. And so, but you're operating, at, it's as a sin of witchcraft. 
And witchcraft, it, it doesn't just necessarily mean that you have, you know, that you're, you're putting curses on people. It's control, manipulation, and dominance, where you try to control everything. And you try to, um, you know, take control. And, and you know, again, it's all about protecting yourself. All right? So now, some of the root, the root, really, when you think of rejection, to me, it's misplaced identity. When you really don't know you're a son, you're a daughter, you're an heir in Christ. He loves you with an everlasting love. And that, that even though you were rejected at school, I mean, talk about, all right, you have your, your family life where you've experienced rejection growing up, but then you have school life where you're bullied or your teachers shamed you, made fun of you, and that happened to me a lot in school. And it really did a number on me. And I mean, I had to go through, I went to a Catholic school, and I had to go through these certain nuns that I had to forgive because they were mean. And I became an atheist. I was an atheist. I would tell everybody, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. God doesn't exist. Well, because they were the representation of God to me. And they were mean as a snake. And so, not all of them. I did forgive them. But some of them, some of them were really mean. But, I mean, there were some that were nice, maybe two. But everybody else, they were mean. Mean, right? And so, I mean, they hit you. I mean, it was bad. So anyway, so many of us base our, even our identity on what our peers think, what our teachers think about us, right? You know, we make ourselves vulnerable to that. What, what about the movies? What about the actors and actresses? You know, what about magazines? When girls are growing up, they're so impressionable, and you're looking at these models that are flawless. Well, they're airbrushed. Nobody's flawless, right? And so, you know, I mean, they're all working on doing something to get something to look flawless. And so, you know, I mean, but, but you, you, you compare yourself, and that's such a trap of the enemy. Again, if you don't love yourself, if you don't reject yourself, you will fall into that trap, okay? So that's how you get into um, your performance and all that. So let me ask you a question. Who or what defines you, right? Does the word define you? Who defines you? Does media define you? Is it your job, your parents, your workplace, money? Does that define you? How much, you know, how, what kind of a home you live in, does that define you? And it, is, is that, you know, what do you think of yourself? And so, and that's the other thing. It's like, Lord, I want to see myself through your eyes. Yeah. I don't want to see myself through what I think. I want to see myself through your eyes, Lord. And that's really important. Yeah. And so, um, you know, so even right now, if there's any kind of areas where you, you're harboring any kind of unforgiveness or maybe where you're not loving yourself or maybe where you've rejected yourself, just think about it right now. Write it down. Bring it before the Lord. And because God wants us to get to that place where we are so trusting him with our lives, period. And uh, that, you know, because God never wanted us to be apart. And when you're battling with rejection, I can promise you, you are withdrawn from the Lord. And there's a passive attitude with him. Because you don't believe that, well, why would he love me? I didn't believe my husband loved me. Why would I believe he loved me? You know? And so you can, you know, a lot of times, see, my father was a wonderful man but by the time I came around you know my sister Linda had more uh, opportunity with him Nana but for me in my eyes the way I perceived it the way I saw it, my father worked three jobs now he's trying now he's a good man right he's trying to support our family and but uh, the way my perception of it was when it came time to me he was too busy you see now that what my father that wasn't his heart but that's the way I perceived it. But my father was working three jobs to support my family. And so that was the thing. But, but in my eyes, I didn't feel that. I, so when it, the Lord spoke to me, and he said to me one day, he said, well, part of your problem is you think I'm not interested in you. Because that's how I saw my father. See, and so a lot, that's why, again, the father's love message is really important. But I want to tell you, God is very interested in each and every one of us. And, and so, again, I had to repent. And there was a judgment I had against my dad. And my father never even did anything to me that made me think that, other than the fact that he wasn't around. And, and, you know, and when he was there, he would want to speak to me or speak into me. But it was very far and few between because he worked so many hours. 
So that affected me growing up. So again, you know, God is a loving father. Sometimes if you've endured abuse, you think that he's abusive or not interested in you or very distant. You know, you have to say, Lord, where, where am I with you? How do I see you? Because sometimes, not always, but sometimes we can project our earthly father onto God the Father. That can hinder our healing. All right? So, anyway, everybody doing okay? All right. All right. So, uh, let's see. I, I did mention that children are especially vulnerable to the damage of rejection because they're still developing their identity. That's why I said earlier but um, about some of the crazy things that they're allowing these kids to make decisions on. But we have to get our identity from the Word. So I wrote down some of the scriptures, and we're going to pray. And I'm going to open it up for questions, but we're going to pray, and we're going to take authority over a spirit of rejection and, and any kind of root system or a generational curse of rejection that could be operating in your life, okay? Or in people that you know that you want to minister to. So... Um, some of the scriptures are that, that really have ministered to me um, is that, first of all, God promises us uh, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So when you feel alone, when you're feeling that, that no one is there for you, he's always there for us. And so in Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never, ever leave you nor forsake you. Never. Never. All right. So um, because of his great love, the Bible says we are adopted into his family. We're joint heirs with Christ in Ephesians one, five through seven. I love the way it's worded in the amplified. It says he predestined and lovingly planned for us to be adopted to himself as his own children through Jesus Christ. None of us were accidents. All right. And it says here with uh, the kind, this kind of intention and good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, his son, Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption, that is our deliverance and salvation through his blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin in according with the riches of his grace. So he planned for us to be adopted. It wasn't like, oh, well, this poor guy over here doesn't have anybody, so let me welcome him into my family. No, he planned for you, Nate, to be in the family, right? Yeah. It's, um, Romans 3.22, we are the righteousness of Christ through faith, thus being made right before God. That's why, see, the enemy is always after our faith. Right. And it says we're entitled to a clean conscience before God because of the blood and have full assurance of faith when we go before him. The Bible says in Hebrews, we can come boldly before the throne room of grace. Why? Because we have access, because of the blood. Amen? And so, I, you know, I love this in Psalm 103, 12. Our sins have been removed from us as far as the east is from the west, and God himself has chosen not to remember our failures. You have got to remember that because enemy is constantly bringing up our past, and you need to tell the enemy to keep his mouth shut. And in Psalm 27, 10, it says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. When you don't feel you have anyone around, the Lord says, I will take you up and I will protect you. I will be there for you. I will love on you. I will encourage you. I have Holy Spirit there to, to comfort you. And, and so you're not going to settle, again, rejection issues fully until you get it down in your spirit. You are loved and accepted and, and, and appreciated by the Lord. Because that religious spirit, I'm going to tell you, wants you to look at yourself as this perfected, you know, individual that has to get everything right. You never had a, an issue in your family. Your kids are perfect. Everybody's perfect. Well, honey, if that's you, then come and pray over me. Because that's just not reality. And the enemy tries to make that picture a, a place of reality, and that's not the case. So there's a lot more I can say, but I want to give you, I want to give you opportunity to um, ask any questions if you have any, and then we're going to pray and take authority over. And I, and I typed it out just in the, in the example of a prayer when you're dealing with people with rejection. Listen, people, when, when they're battling with addictions, most often it's rooted in rejection. There's bondages that are there, but it's, it's, you have like a, a death wish on your life. You don't care about your life. Wow. Yeah. And so 
there, there's some root issues that we're going to identify. We're going we're gonna to deal with this as, as we progress in the teachings here. But rejection is one of the key things that I found that we have got to deal with because every single one of us have experienced something that even, you know, and here's the other thing that's so interesting about deliverance. You may have, let's say, experienced a rejection as a kid. Let's say you were bullied or made fun of, or, or maybe you lived in a violent neighborhood like I did where I was attacked a lot, and so where you had to fight and so uh, for survival. So it may not have affected you right away, the trauma of that, but maybe in your adult life it affects you. It surfaces at different times. It's not like, well, right away I would have known that. No, not necessarily. So, and that's the thing. So sometimes it's like that, and that's why your prayer time with the Lord is so valuable and so important because that's Holy Spirit to show you your root issues, show you the whys behind it, okay? And he will, I promise you. So I typed out an example of, of a prayer, but it doesn't, I mean, you can word it however you want to word it, but this is just a sample of a prayer that we would pray. Um, and I change it every time I pray with people because I can never remember <laughs> my last thing I said. So I always change it. So don't be concerned about that. It just has, really, it's Holy Spirit as he leads. Now, before I open it up for questions, you do have this tree that we have used um, often in um, deliverance. And uh, we know their daughter, um, and I, we know her, and I can't think of her name, but Noel and Phil Gibson from Australia, um, are the ones who put this together, and it's in their book called uh, Evicting Demonic Truders. And by the way, Doris Wagner has a wonderful book on deliverance. Um, I think it's uh, How to Cast Out Demons, yeah, by Doris Wagner. It's really good. All right, so we can see here there's a lot of components here when it comes to rejection. So you have, you, you see the root, you see the root in this tree here, the root cause of rejection. And I, I identified some of these. Um, it can be in utero. You know, where a mom, I didn't say this before, uh, but when a mom's considering an abortion or a mom or sometimes financially, they're really upset that they had, um, that they got pregnant, but they still had the child, that child can feel rejection in the womb. All right. So in the manner of birth, you know, um, sometimes, you know, I know they would talk about forceps or, or maybe the kid, you know, had a problem giving birth. Um, the baby not being bonded to her mom, the child that was adopted can have major um, issues with rejection, hereditary rejections in the family. It's a behavior that you've learned, right? Uh, factors in your home life. I went over some of this. Problems caused by school, self-rejection, called by your own attitudes, and multiple causes in life. And then, and then you can go up here and then just look at all the, the fruit of this with aggressive reactions, you have self-rejection symptoms of, you know, fear of failure. And that's a biggie. Oh, Lord Jesus, I didn't want to do anything. I was so afraid. I was paralyzed in stepping out. So afraid. Fear of failure. Fear of others' opinions. Anxiety, worry, depression. And I mentioned some of this. And then you read here over where it says measures to counter fear of rejection. You know, so independence was big with me. Isolation, self-protection, self-centeredness, self-idolatry, self-righteousness, criticism. See, so review that whole thing. And then what I want you to do is when you're alone, ask the Lord, am I battling? Some of it you may know, but other things could be hidden that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal to you. Just ask him. Because Jesus, again, came to set us free, and he doesn't want any of these uh, roots to, to be within us. So um, before we pray... Um, I just want to give anybody an opportunity. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask, feel free to do so now. Where's the mic, um, David? Okay. Anybody here? You're leaving, Jim? You have a problem? <laughs> you have a problem with rejection? You don't like what I said? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anybody want to ask for a friend? <laughs> all right, everybody's good? All right, I know all of you, a lot of you have been through it. You've been with us for many years, so we're good. Do you want to ask for anybody, really? Like any, anything, you don't have any questions. Hon, do you have a question? Okay. All right, so then we're going to pray. All right, so I have prayers for deliverance from rejection. And so... 
I, I put on top of here about renouncing generational rejection. Now, we are going to teach a class on generational curses. So I'm, I, that's why I didn't really want to get into that. But um, so this would be the sample prayer. And I'm going to just go over it, and then we're going to pray it, okay? So in Jesus' name, I renounce a generational spirit of rejection that has been passed down to me by my ancestors. I forgive my ancestors for passing that spirit down to me, but I renounce it and reject it from my life. I, rene I, re I renounce all forms of rejection, fear of rejection, self-rejection, perceived rejection, and I forgot to put expected rejection, all right? And then, in Jesus' name, I renounce every spirit of rejection. And then, I, I, I mentioned it again. And then, if you can remember, not necessarily, but if the entry points. Like when, for example, when my mother told me every birthday that, um, you know, she was, um, wanted me to be a boy, you know. And, again, my mother didn't mean anything by it. I mean, because even when I challenged her and said something, like, maybe three years before she passed, she got mad at me. She goes, oh, I didn't mean it, you know. But I, I took it as personal, right? But I had to, so that particular scenario I brought before the Lord, and I truly forgave my mother. I said, Lord, I thank you that, that you planned for me to be a girl. You planned for me to be born, okay, and blah, blah, blah. So, so if there are certain instances of being bullied or if there are certain instances of, you know, that you were rejected by a teacher or, or by your employer or by your husband or by your wife, you know, pray it. All right. Um, so I renounce and reject the spirit of rejection as you have no authority in my, over my life. You have each and every one of us because we are blood born redeemed. We have powerful authority over the enemy. The enemy is under our feet. I renounce and, and reject the spirit of rejection as you know with I read that. I can't I close every door against the spirit of rejection and cancel every legal right that rejection had to operate in my life. I command the spirit of inherited rejection or generational curse, fear of rejection, self rejection, perceived rejection, expected rejection, to lose their hold on me in Jesus' name. And then the person now see, let me just say this. You can do self-deliverance. Some people say you can't. You can, you can do self-deliverance. I've done it many times on myself. And where you take authority over the spirit. But there are times that you get stuck and you need help. And you need people that you try that to pray with you. We've, we all have done it. All right? But here it says the minister prays in the name of Jesus. I, you know, I, I, I say I command the spirit of rejection, you know, to, or fear of rejection. Whatever you're dealing with. To come out in Jesus' name. I no longer align with you. I don't submit myself to you. I command my freedom now in Jesus' name. And, and you don't have any legal right. The enemy can't stay against your will. You don't have any legal right. Get out in Jesus' name. And I demand my freedom. And see, you have to be determined to walk in, in, in freedom. And so basically, you know, that would be some prayer when we're focusing on a spirit of rejection. You know, and so... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to read the prayer. Pray it along with me. And, um, you know, I may change the wording around a little bit. But just, 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 you know, pray with me. And just if there's anything, ask Holy Spirit if there's anything in your life. It might be in your kid's life. It might be in your employee's life. You know, it might be in people that you know. But, but I always go before the Lord. Because, listen, there's still times that, that there's something, you know, and you'll feel that intimidation come on you. Or you'll feel that, like, ooh, icky spirit. A lot of times you're, you're sensing what that person's operating in. But what happens is you're taking it on yourself. And that I've learned to do now. Because, you know, how sometimes you can be perfectly fine walking into the room and all of a sudden you're feeling really insecure and intimidated. Like, what in the world just happened? Yeah. You're picking up. You're discerning what is in the room. Right, and, and we'll teach on discerning of spirits. But... But I, I, there's, I would get so depressed. I think so many people that are even, like, struggling with depression and are on meds, it's because they're so sensitive in the spirit realm. They haven't learned. or They're not Christian. They're not identifying with the spirit realm. And they're, they're picking up something, and they're thinking it's them, and it's not. So that's another thing. If you're sensing that and you're really starting to try, ask the Lord, is it me? Because I was totally fine, or am I picking up something? Now, don't go up to the person and just start, ask the Holy Spirit if it's okay for you to say something to that person. But, but you know, like learn how to operate in this. And, and like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll give you guidelines in dealing with that. But that has helped me tremendously um, with working with myself and with others. All right? So we're going to pray. All right, so... 
Just say, in Jesus' name, I renounce and I come out of agreement with a generational spirit of rejection that has been passed down through my ancestors. I forgive my ancestors for this open door and I renounce it and I reject it. I renounce all forms of rejection. Fear of rejection, self-rejection, perceived rejection, and expected rejection. Okay. And then if you, I'll, I'll pause here for a moment, and if, if there's any um, remembrance of any situation that occurred in your life that you can think of right now, just bring it before the Lord. You don't have to say it out loud, but just bring it before the Lord because it's really important that you do that right now. And it could be something that you may think is minor, but that little minor thing, the little foxes are what spoil the vine, is what's holding you in bondage. And then even practice this at home with not only spirit of rejection, anything that's hurt you. <clears throat> All right, so you can say, I renounce and reject the spirit of rejection as you have no authority over my life. I close every door against the spirit of rejection and I cancel every legal right that rejection has had to operate in my life. And I command the spirit of rejection, generational curse of rejection, fear of rejection, self-rejection, perceived rejection and expected rejection to loose their hold on me now in Jesus' name. Now, you can just sit there and I'll pray. Now, in Jesus' name, I take authority over a spirit of rejection and generational curse of rejection, self-rejection, expected rejection, and perceived rejection. I command you in Jesus' name to loose your hold on, on the children of God right now in Jesus' name. Your legal right has been taken from, from them right now in Jesus' name. And I loose the power of the blood of Jesus. And I decree that no weapon of rejection formed against them will prosper, for this is their inheritance in you, O oh God. Now, Lord, I just thank you for freedom. I thank you, Lord, for your uprooting any root system of rejection. I thank you for cleansing them. Lord, I thank you that they are accepted in the Beloved. And we bind every lying spirit, and we forbid you from tormenting them in Jesus' name. And we loose the spirit of truth over their lives. And we say, Lord, you are the spirit of truth, and your truth prevails. And your, your truth destroys the work of the enemy in Jesus' name. Now, Lord, I just thank you for the power of your blood. And I thank you, Father, that that spirit of rejection in, in our lives have been exposed and, Lord, you said that we can speak to that root, and we pull that root out, and we demand and we decree complete deliverance and freedom in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. 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 Now, again, like I said uh, yet last week, you know, a lot of times when you're praying for deliverance for yourself or for others, you can, um, sometimes you feel like you want to burp, laugh, yawn, nothing. Um, but sometimes, you know, we'll tell people, cough, just, just because it's a spirit let it out and sometimes you just feel like a weight coming off of you you don't have to have a manifestation because we have learned i learned the hard way that when we bring people through breaking inner vows and bitter root judgments and break go through unforgiveness we don't have them crazy uh, manifestations but a lot of times when you're getting free you just feel that uh, to release it or to cough or we were just meeting with somebody and the person looks at me and you know spirits mock you and he's like oh my god I'm, he, he just burst out laughing and that's a spirit a mocking spirit wants to laugh at what you're doing don't pay any attention just command to be quiet and get out and so there are different there are different things so you, you can review your notes from last week but coughing yawning so we, i've ministered to people where their eyes roll back and they just you know, you thought maybe they died or, or look, they look like they're going to, they just want to fall asleep on you. Uh, or they roll back and fall down. I mean, 
He just, he just, it's that spirit not wanting to leave that individual. And so that can happen. So um, anyway, but, you know, again, the enemy likes a show, and he wants you to focus on that. We don't, mm -mm, we're like, oh, no, 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 we're not having that. And so we'll just really um, a deal with that spirit. Yeah, I just want to encourage, I know there was a lot of people watching online tonight, and this might be new for you. Um, and I guess the warning would be that there could be some things stirred up that you haven't thought about in a long time, and that could cause like a flight mechanism to kick in because you're not familiar with that feeling. So we would just encourage you to pray through that, have a good friend that you know is mature and grounded in the word that loves you and knows you that you can talk to about things or keep a journal. We found that's a really helpful thing to keep a journal because if you remember as a child, we used to play a game called connect the dots, connect the numbers. And when you looked at the pattern, you couldn't tell what it was, but then one dot to two to three to four, and then all of a sudden it would start to appear. And that's how this seems to be for a lot of people. If you had trauma when you were younger, there's a, another thing that happens in your body that just causes you to keep functioning even though you had that terrible thing happen, and it'll just sit in the back of your unconscious. But as the Lord senses that you're willing to, to go down and, and find some of those things, he'll, he'll start to release some of those things for you. It won't, you know, it won't be overwhelming, or it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It might feel that way initially, but it's just an echo. It's not the real thing that's happening, but it can feel very real. So you just want to walk through it and try not to bail on the process. And that's when it really helps to have somebody that you know loves you to, to pray through these things with you. Because the devil doesn't like to let go, right? But he has to bow to the authority of the name of the Lord, right? It's the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are safe and saved. So you're, um, the, the feelings that you're having are real, but they're not grounded in truth. They're grounded in the lie that you believed about yourself. So that's my encouragement is to, to try to not allow your feelings to stop you from, from going on this journey, but also don't think that you have to find everything out in day one. It's progressive. And if you just start to do the little things right each day, You'll, you'll notice a great momentum will start to build. And then, boy, when you start getting free and those things don't have a hold of you anymore, then you know the power of God is, is strong enough. So now that next thing could become a little bit easier and the next after that. So that's our encouragement to you is just don't be too hard on yourself because that can happen when you have self-rejection. You think, I'm not going to be any good at this, right? So you automatically assume that it's going to take longer for you than somebody else. Don't do that to yourself. Just just uh, allow yourself to plug into the process of God and, and don't put any uh, too great demands on yourself. He's really good at helping you walk through this process. So thanks for being with us tonight. So, and that's the other thing, and my husband just mentioned it. Don't try to dredge up everything. Just ask Holy Spirit, show me what I need to deal with. Right. And, um, and it's a process. And, and for some, it's quick. I remember when I, went, uh, when I had a meeting set up to go through deliverance, I was so intimidated. And I thought, no, because it's me, I'm not going to do it right, and I'm not going to get set free. Don't do that. <laughs> I mean, it was just the enemy just trying to set me up. But, but no, it's a process, but, but it doesn't have to be a long process. But try to listen to, 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 you know, messages on the Father's love. We will have this available. Go over these messages. And, and can we have the notes put up online? Yeah. We'll have the notes available online for those of you who are watching online. Um, and, um, you know, it'll be really helpful. Take your time. Go through it. Just ask the Lord to show you. Don't, don't you know, camp out there. Right. And then... Um, you know, but you'll know if you're battling with rejection. You'll know what you have to address. But then uh, just allow the Holy Spirit to, to comfort you. And, and especially when you're dealing with self-hatred or self-rejection, don't beat yourself up through this process because it's really easy to do. That's right. and, and just, you know, again, always remember the Lord is there with his arms wrapped around about you, loving on you and comforting you. Amen. So, Lord, we just thank you for each and every person here. We just thank you, Father, for the, your presence and power of Holy Spirit. 
that your brooding presence over us to break barrenness off our lives and cause us to be fruitful and to bear fruit in this season unlike anything we've ever experienced. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the ability. We thank you for your discernment. We thank you for your wisdom, O oh God. And we thank you, O oh God, that you want to break through in our lives. You want to break through in our families' lives, as impossible as it might seem. But, Lord, we thank you and we yield and submit to you because with you nothing shall be called impossible. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen.